We good? Okay. All right, the uh, first matter we're going to talk about is the uh, termination today of Deputy Ural Darling. Uh, Deputy Darling was hired by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office in 1995. He'd been here for 22 years, and for the last 17 years, he was the school resource officer at Osceola Middle School. Um, this case involves a 13-year-old uh, boy uh, who has autism spectrum disorder. And he began at Osceola Middle School last school year, so about a year ago now. And he was in the sixth grade and in a class at Osceola Middle for kids with autism. Uh, while he's 13 years old, uh, his cognitive level is that of a first grader and his communication skills are that of a kindergartner. Deputy Darley's first contact with this child was in January of 2017. During January, uh, the bus circle in front of the school, uh, there were buses going in and out, and the child uh, liked the sound of motors and engines, and so he was there at the bus circle. Deputy Darling had contact with him and learned then that the child had autism and escorted him to the behavioral specialist office. Uh, there was really nothing more to that incident than what I've just described. But on March 27th, uh, the child's mother, Megan Dowdy. And we've given you um, some uh, documents. One of them is a transcript, and it identifies Megan Dowdy uh, as the child's mother, and she has consented uh, to us uh, that she's okay with you all having her information. And in fact, anybody that wants to, she's willing to be interviewed, and we'll provide her contact information when I finish here. But Megan Dowdy uh, contacted the school because her son was having a, quote, meltdown at home. And there was some allegation that during the January incident that Deputy Darling had inappropriately squeezed uh, his arm and had placed him in some sort of a timeout room. Um, that resulted in a meeting the next day on March 28th at the school between the principal, other school staff, and Deputy Darling. And it was determined that there was nothing inappropriately done by Deputy Darling or anybody else during the January incident. Uh, Megan said that she was satisfied with the outcome of that meeting. Then on May 4th, uh, the child had a meltdown uh, at school and turned over a desk in class. The child was suspended from the school for one day, but there was no interaction with Deputy Darling on the May 4th incident. On May 15th, Megan Dowdy, the child's mother, placed a recording device in his pants pocket. He was wearing cargo shorts, and she placed the recorder in the pocket of his shorts. The reason why she did that was is that the child was uh, regressing, uh, having more and more meltdowns at home and in school, and she was concerned that something was happening at school that was causing him to regress, so he was having more of these meltdowns related to the autism. On the same day uh, that she put the recorder in the child's pocket, uh, May 15th, is that during his first period class at Osceola Middle School, the child began to act out. And he threw a book at the teacher. The teacher contacted the behavioral specialist. The behavioral specialist went to the classroom and called Deputy Darling uh, to the classroom. As they removed the child from the classroom and walked to the behavioral specialist's office, it's captured on video uh, during the walk in the hallway, and we'll show you the video here in a second. And while walking down the hall, uh, there was also audio captured by the device that was in the child's pocket. And Deputy Darling began to yell at the child and told him to put his hands behind his back. And Deputy Darling had his handcuffs out and was spinning the handcuff, the ratchet on the handcuff. So he was taunting the kid and t telling him that uh, he had to put his hands behind his back and he was asking him, this is, this is what you've been wanting, right? So there's this taunting as they're walking down the hallway. Deputy Darling told the child to stop that crap, quote unquote, and then said, now let me start throwing books at you. And he asks him, do you want me to throw these handcuffs on you as well? So he's doing that while they're walking and he's taunting them by spinning the handcuffs. Uh, when they entered the behavioral specialist's office, Deputy Darling took somewhere between three and five books from a shelf and made the child stand there in the room with his hands out in front of him 
and the books in the hands. So he makes the kid stand there, puts the books in his hands, and has the kid there facing him. At that point, Deputy Darling began to challenge the child uh, as he's standing there with these books in his hands to throw the books at him. And then when the child does begin to throw the books, then he commands him not to throw the books. Now remember that this kid is 13 years old, but he's got the cognitive ability of a first grader and the communication skills of a kindergartner. So Deputy Darling is sitting there taunting this kid with handcuffs, spinning them around, uh, making threats to the kid, and forcing the kid to stand there with these books in his hand, and then telling the kid, throw the books, and then when the kid goes to throw the books, he says, don't throw the books. He also tells him to stop his, quote, crap, and tells the boy, again, that he's going to throw the books at him. And he told the child that he was going to put the handcuffs on, quote, real tight. He also told the child that he was not to put the books down until Deputy Darling allowed him to do so. Now, during the course of this, probably five minutes or so, as he was holding the books, Darling continued to yell and berate the child and threatened him that he was going to take him into custody under the Baker Act. And he told this 13-year-old with autism, I need to take you to, quote, a mental hospital, and asked him, is that where you want to stay for the rest of your life? He told the boy that if he took him to the mental hospital, they would keep him forever. And if he throws books again, that he belongs in a mental hospital. Now, Darling eventually allowed the boy to put the books down and put them on a shelf. Uh, the child did calm down temporarily, uh, but then became agitated again. And Deputy Darling said, I'm not fixing to play now. I'm fixing to get pissed off, quote unquote. So Deputy Darling was with the child for about 25 minutes uh, before leaving, and then the child's mother came and picked him up. Uh, after getting the child home, Megan Dowdy looked, I'm sorry, listened uh, to the recording and contacted the school board. The school board, um, after receiving the complaint, referred it over to us for investigation. Now, we've got the video, uh, we've got the audio, we'll play a short clip of it, and then uh, finish up with some more information and take any questions you have. So, go ahead, Spencer. So that's Deputy Darling walking down to the classroom where he had thrown the books. That's the boy. Okay. Now go ahead with the audio. You can see him, he's you get a little bit of video there, but he's spinning those handcuffs and he's telling him to put his hands behind his back and there were several, you'll hear it, is the one around on the handcuffs. He does that a few times. You'll be able to follow along in a minute. The transcript you have in front of you is a transcript of this. No. What do you need 
but you get the gist of it, you have the transcript. Um, the, 
some of the worst parts of that is when he threatens this kid to take him to the mental hospital and he's going to stay there forever is the kid standing there and he's got these books in his hands and he's berating them and flipping the handcuff on the ratchets and uh, it's certainly uh, with a kid that has autism uh, who has the cognitive ability of a first grader and, and the communication skills of a kindergartner is just wrong. Um, the uh, investigation uh, resulted in an administrative review board that was conducted yesterday. Uh, the administrative review board recommended uh, substantiation of the allegations against Deputy Darling. It was brought to me for uh, decision today, this afternoon, and based upon Deputy Darling's conduct, I decided to terminate his employment from the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. Um, during the investigation, Deputy Darling was unapologetic for his actions. Uh, he maintained that what he did was appropriate, including telling this 13-year-old that he was going to put him in a mental hospital for the rest of his life. He maintained that his tactics and techniques were appropriate, but admitted and also admitted that he had never been trained to act the way he did. As I said, Deputy Darling's uh, been an SRO at Osceola Middle School for 17 years. Uh, he has received training in how to deal with children with autism. Uh, he's also graduated from the Crisis Intervention Team Program. And against that backdrop in 17 years, unfortunately, is Deputy Darling did a lot of good at Osceola Middle School um, and was well regarded by the community and by the staff there. And in fact, the internal affairs file uh, this week, we, re we received 60 letters from the staff, including the principal at Osceola Middle uh, regarding Deputy Darling's overall accomplishments during his 17 years at the school. But I'll say that the uh, staff there uh, and the people who wrote those letters uh, didn't have the information that we have uh, regarding his conduct and the investigation. So, as I said a few minutes ago, um, uh, Megan Dowdy, uh, the boy's mother, um, is willing to talk to you all. If you want her contact information, our public information office will provide that to you. So, uh, anybody have any questions on that? Sheriff, was it legal to record that if the uh, deputy did not know it was being recorded? Yeah, yeah, there's no problem with that. Under Florida law or federal law, it wouldn't be a problem. Is, is that it's a public area and you have to have uh, an expectation of privacy or an expectation of non interception in order for it to uh, be protected communication. So under those circumstances, um, it, there's no problem with it. Are there staff in the school there? What's happened to that sense? Yes, and, and I'd refer you to uh, the school board for any questions you have. As you can see in the transcript, the behavioral specialist was there. And she was present during this uh, and participating in the, in the conversation. But the conversation uh, was driven by Deputy Darling and, of course, all of the threats and the uh, spinning of the handcuffs and making this kid with autism sit there with the books in his hands and all of the other things that were done were all done in decisions by Deputy Darling. Uh, but there was a school board employee, a behavioral specialist, who was there while this was happening. Can you talk more about this, the extent of this, you know, how the training on how to deal with someone that's autistic is? Right. Was that enough? Well, you know, I think here, I don't think it's a question of training because he maintained throughout that these tactics were appropriate. He believed in what he was doing. And that's one of the troubling things for me with this, and it contributed to the decision to terminate his employment because he was not apologetic. He didn't realize, he didn't say that I got this wrong. This is not the way to handle these things. And he admitted that it was inconsistent with his training. So I think we need to look at uh, doing more, but he, he's just misguided in how he's handling this thing. What was his excuse? Was it just kind of tough love here, or a little bit, a little bit, and that he thought that that what he was trying to do was is to prove to this kid that this kid was really not afflicted by autism, and that this kid really was in control of his emotions, control of his faculties, and control of his decision making, and that this kid could control himself if he wanted, and that this behavior, so what his excuse was, his explanation was, is that by making this kid with autism sit there with these books in these hands and hold them there, is that the kid could make decisions, the kid could do what he was told to do, and he was choosing not to when he was acting out. It's really some skewed logic in what he was thinking about uh, in making the kid do what he did. It didn't make any sense. Um, and again, he was not apologetic. He wasn't remorseful for it. And in essence, would do it again uh, if he had the opportunity. Can you talk a little bit more about the interactions between the student and um, uh, the, the uh, SRO? Um, go back over what happened when he was outside and near the car circle? Yeah, so back in January, he's out there by the car circle. and. Um, my understanding is, is that kids with autism 
is, is that they like certain noises and they gravitate to certain noises like engine noises and motor noises, et cetera. It's, it's a stimulant. So the kid was out there by the car circle because of the buses and there was a bus circle and because of the engines and the motors. So Deputy Darling found him at that point, uh, identified him, realized he was a kid with autism and took him to the behavioral specialist's office. Now there was some escorting and touching in there, but nothing that was inappropriate. He just needed to get him out of the bus circle. And then uh, a couple months later, something happened at home with the mom. And, and I don't know exactly what the dialogue was, but there was some dialogue between the boy and the mom that led the mom to believe that Deputy Darling had put his hands on the kid inappropriately and put him in this timeout area somehow inappropriately. So that's in March. Now, again, the incident was back in January. And then so she contacts the school. There's a meeting. They go through it, and everybody has their concerns alleviated as to whether there was anything inappropriate. So really the point of all that is, is that Deputy Darling had had prior contact with the kid, knew the kid had autism, knew that he was on the autism spectrum disorder, that he was in a special program there, and that he had special needs. So then there was another incident in the classroom. Again, the kid was suspended, but Darling wasn't involved in that. And then he was called to the classroom on May 15th, and when he gets to the classroom, because the kid threw a book, is, is that he goes into this tirade on the kid and does what he does. Okay. Anybody have anything else on that one? Okay. So on Thursday, August 17th, uh, deputies responded to On uh, Thursday, August 17th, deputies responded to 2426 Persian Drive in Clearwater. It's in the top of the world uh, condominium complex up off Sunset Point Road in the area of Belcher Road in Clearwater. And uh, we received a call because a friend of the victim, and the victim is Christopher Weimer, W-E-I-M-E-R, he's a 61-year-old male, uh, had entered his apartment and had found him deceased. Uh, it was evident uh, that he had been dead for several days. Uh, the body was in a state of decomposition. Uh, Sheriff's Office homicide unit detectives began an investigation. And as a result of that investigation, uh, today uh, charged Robert Miller, who's a male, 38 years old, uh, who's currently in the Pinellas County Jail uh, with first degree murder. Uh, what we know happened is on Saturday, uh, August 12th, at about 8 o'clock p.m., Weimer picked up Miller in the area of San Remo Drive and Gulf to Bay Boulevard in Clearwater. Um, Miller is a transient, uh, quasi-homeless, goes back and forth between different places, uh, is a drug user, crack cocaine user, hangs out a lot on the street. Uh, Miller did not know Weimer, uh, and Weimer is a uh, homosexual male who goes out onto the street and picks up uh, homeless males and brings them back to his apartment to engage in sex and drug use. And Weimer uh, picked Miller up for that purpose and Miller had sold Weimer some crack cocaine. But after he sold him the crack cocaine, Miller also invited him to come back to his apartment to use it. So after they left, this is about eight o'clock at night on Saturday the 12th, is that the next thing we know is they go to a Valero gas station on Belcher Road uh, in the just north of Sunset Point Road in Clearwater, which is just down the street from the top of the world uh, condominium complex. And we know that because we have Weimer and Miller on video in the store. They buy beer and they go back to Weimer's apartment. Um, what we know uh, from Miller's statements that he made to detectives today and from other uh, people that we've interviewed is, is that Weimer and Miller engaged in sexual activity within the apartment. Uh, they were in there for about five hours. Uh, at one point, uh, somebody else came over to purchase crack cocaine. Uh, Weimer had gone down to get more crack cocaine. And at some point during the evening, the consensual sexual activity uh, disturbed Miller, and he got upset about it, and he struck Weimer in the head. Uh, when he struck Weimer to the head, Weimer uh, went to the ground, uh, still conscious, still alive. And at that point, Miller took a rope. It's a, like a, really of a belt. 
in more of a braided belt, like a braided leather belt. And he bound Weimer's hands behind his back. He took a piece of cloth and put a gag around his mouth and left him there in the apartment. Uh, at that point, he stole the keys to the car. He stole credit cards, several credit cards, and he stole Weimer's cell phones. Um, he left, we've got him on video, leaving the top, the top of the World Apartment Complex at about 1.50 a.m., which would be on the 13th. And between the 13th and the next several days, uh, Miller and his wife uh, used Weimer's credit cards at a variety of locations uh, to make purchases of bicycles and chainsaws and all kinds of other uh, merchandise and pawn it at pawn shops in Pinellas County. Um, this past Sunday morning, uh, the 20th, uh, Miller was arrested by the Clearwater Police Department on a burglary charge and has been in the Pinellas County Jail since this past Sunday morning. And as I said this afternoon, uh, detectives uh, interviewed Miller and he admitted to committing the robbery and leaving Weimer there. Um, Weimer died as a result of being tied up and left on the floor, and it was during the course of the robbery that he died, and that's the basis for the first degree murder charge. So, anybody have any other questions on that one? Okay. All right, thanks.